Welcome to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In this broadcast, our expert panelists will be discussing international law and the Trump administration. Joining us remotely from a studio in Washington, D.C. is John Bellinger, a partner at Arnold and Porter Law Firm, who served previously as the Department of State legal advisor during the Bush administration. Welcome to the show, John. Great to be with you, Mike. And with John in D.C. is Dr. Paul Williams, president of the Public International Law and Policy Group, a Nobel Peace Prize nominated NGO with offices in 10 countries. Hey, Paul. Hey, Mike. It's great to be here. And here at the WCPN Idea Studio in Cleveland, we are joined by Dr. Shannon French, the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence, who has previously taught at the U.S. Naval Academy. Shannon. Happy to be here, Michael. And finally, we have Professor Melena Stereo, Associate Dean at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, who's been a frequent guest on our show and is an expert in international law and policy. It's a pleasure to be here. So thank you all. Uh, John, Paul, Shannon, and Melena for being on the program. You know, I almost said John, Paul, George, and Ringo. <laughs> for, you, you guys are the rock stars of international law, so that would have been appropriate. Let's start with the big picture, and we'll begin with Melena. How would you describe the major foreign policy goals of the Trump administration? Sure. So the Trump administration has announced its foreign policy on the White House Uh, website, actually, and it's called the America First policy. Its main goals are really putting American national interests first, America first, having a strong military, but then also having a strong economy. Now, the real question is, um, in concrete terms, what does this translate into? And there's a little bit of a discrepancy between what candidate Trump had talked about and what President Trump has actually done. So candidate Trump, for example, has talked about putting a strong emphasis on defeating ISIS and essentially bombing ISIS into oblivion. President Trump Trump has been a little bit more reluctant when it comes to military action against ISIS. But the other key points, uh, parts of this foreign policy are essentially um, having um, almost unqualified support for Israel, having Saudi Arabia as a strong ally, paying less attention to things like human rights and women's rights, but then also paying great attention to economic policy, uh, promoting American economic interests, and that has translated into um, withdrawing from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and essentially um, talking about perhaps renegotiating the NAFTA trade deal. We'll see whether that actually takes place. So as as far as the major foreign policy goals of the administration, does anybody else want to add to that? I'll just add something. It's John. You know, I, I, I don't think Trump has actually said this, but he's a businessman and he sees foreign policy uh, in transactional terms. And he thinks that we have gotten bad deals. Uh, China with Iran, with Japan, uh, the climate change agreement, NAFTA trade deals, uh, even NATO is a bad deal, the North Atlantic Agreement. He th- seems to think that the previous governments have just not done a good job in negotiating these deals, and he thinks that he, as a business person, can get better terms and negotiate better deals, and we will see if he succeeds. All right, Michael, so this is, this is ahead, Paul. Paul. I, would just, I would just follow up with John's comment and add that I think that uh, President Trump thinks we've got these bad deals because we've led with our values and that somehow he thinks if we no longer lead with our values but lead with our quote unquote the strategic interests as he defines them and as Melena noted that we might actually be able to get better deals. I'm not convinced that's the case. All right. So according to you three, um, the main foreign policy goals have been America first, avoid bad deals or get out of bad deals, and better to focus on strategic interests than values. So back to Melena, what role do you think international law plays within those goals as described by our panelists? Well, well, I actually do think that the Trump administration has paid attention to international law, and I think that's why we see this discrepancy between some of the more sort of aggressive, outrageous statements made by candidate Trump and then what President Trump has actually done. And just to give you an example, 
again, candidate Trump talked about bombing ISIS and even going after ISIS fighters families. Now, we all know that that would be a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. And guess what? President Trump has actually not done that. And even when it comes to renegotiating some of these deals, as of now, we have not withdrawn from NAFTA. And we have actually not even withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement. And so I do think that international law and sort of international law values have been paid attention to, if not by President Trump himself, but then by other people in his administration. Well, are they constraining him? Or when you say he has not done that, have you left out the word yet? (laughs) Well, I think it remains to be seen what he will actually do. But I actually do think that international law, international law values are constraining him. And I think that there are people in the administration essentially guiding him on these issues and trying to persuade him that, look, you know, America cannot be flagrantly violating international law. I don't think that any of our administrations would want to do that. All right. So when John Bellinger was the legal advisor during the Bush administration, one of his colleagues, um, John Bolton, who had been the ambassador to the U.N., he had famous, famously declared, and this, I think, declaration predated him being in that official position, but this was his, his words. He says, international law is not real law, and anyone who thinks differently is simply delusional. So, John, would you say that Bolton's view is embraced by the current Trump administration? I think it's far too soon to tell. There are frankly just not enough people in the Trump administration to really know that. There may be a few, including John Bolton himself, who is uh, advising the Trump administration, who hold that view. But I don't think that from the president on down, there are uh, that many people who hold a very ideological anti-international law view. Certainly General Mattis, Secretary of Defense, who has grown up as a military person complying with the Geneva Conventions and with other agreements, would see the value of international law. And I think many other people in the administration, frankly, probably have just never dealt with international law because they're business people and they really don't know that international law are treaties and agreements between countries. And I think I would probably put the president uh, into, uh, into that category. So it's too soon to tell whether we will see an ideological approach towards international law or whether the pragmatists will uh, end up winning out. But what you're really suggesting is that he has assembled somewhat of a team of rivals who have different views of international law, and we can't see this as all one unified view coming from the president or from Spicer or or someone else, that there is actually maybe even a Darwinian struggle going on behind the doors of the White House for the preeminence of international law. Did you want to add something, Shannon? Well, I was just going to say this is uh, an example of what uh, we were hearing about earlier. The candidate Trump um, loud declarations about torturing people and torturing even the families and so forth went away by and large when Mattis did step in and said, actually, no. You know, not only do we not do that for very good moral reasons, it doesn't even work. Now, I'm sure there are some both within the administration and supporters of the administration who think that John Bolton's view is correct. And I want to ask the panelists, um, is international law merely a set of guidelines for powerful countries to ignore at their convenience without any real consequences? Paul Williams, you wrote a book addressing that very question. How would you answer it? Well, Michael, I think the first part of the answer is to recognize that we shouldn't think of international law in the same way we think of domestic law. It was designed for a different set of outcomes. And the real question is, how does international law operate? And quite frankly, it operates as a set of rules, norms, procedures that create stability and create predictability. And, you know, if you you ask the question of, you know, why is America... Uh, you know, so powerful economically and politically, it's because we spent the last 70 years creating a set of rules and norms that would provide this stability. You know, just as any corporation needs stability and predictability to be successful, so does any country. The corollary is, if we can violate those rules, other countries can violate those rules. Less predictability, less stability, quite frankly, less greatness for the United States. All right. Well, that's the academic answer. And perhaps if uh, Donald Trump is listening, he'll think about it in his corporate experience and embrace that. But let me ask, John, from your experience as the State Department legal advisor, would you say that past presidents viewed international law as binding? Yeah, I think it varies, Michael. I mean, some presidents like President Obama were trained as a constitutional lawyer and studied international law. 
you know, are going to take international law very seriously because they do see it as law. Others uh, who are either not trained as lawyers or not trained uh, in international law uh, really don't understand what international law does for us. They do get uh, their advisors telling them the importance of it, uh, and so they try to abide by it but may not take it as seriously. And this is, you know, this is what Donald Trump is going to need to learn is you know, a lot of people, conservatives, are, uh, are anti-international law until they learn that, you know, that's how we get our letters delivered. Uh, that's why we get to use our driver's licenses to r- drive on foreign roads. That's why we get to fly over other people's countries. These are all pursuant to a series of treaties that we've negotiated to get what we want. Well, Okay, Shannon, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add that I think we are already seeing that maybe some of the consequences are sinking in with the Trump administration. What I have in mind here is the kind of uh, pushback that they got due to leaking sensitive information. They got pushback first from Israel, then from the U.K., and so I think and perhaps also from that, the Pentagon itself, right? True, true. But I was thinking the international okay. partners actually saying, if you do not play by these rules, there are very real consequences mm-hmm. that actually do affect the safety of the U.S. All right. So maybe President Trump and his administration as a whole will not be departing so much from the experience of, and practice of past presidents in the area of international law generally. But let's focus in on the Trump approach to international organizations like the UN. Um, Melina, how might that differ based on what we're hearing from past presidents? Sure. Well, President Trump hasn't exactly been very positive about international organizations. And let me just give you a couple of examples. First, on this, um, his his very first uh, official trip abroad, he met with NATO leaders. And at the speech that he delivered um, at um, NATO headquarters, he basically talked about, complained about how other countries do not contribute monetarily to NATO as much as they should, and then failed to reaffirm American commitment to um, Um, the very famous Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, which talks about mutual defense, which is really the cornerstone of NATO. So not exactly a very uh, positive speech at NATO. And when it comes to, for example, the United Nations, Donald Trump has also complained about the fact that the United States is supposed to contribute financially much, much more than any other countries and has essentially threatened to withhold United States financial support of the United Nations. So, you know, not, not, not a very engaging and positive approach towards international organizations. Organizations. All right. Well, we're coming to our first break. When we return, we'll dive more deeply into President Trump's approach to human rights, global climate change, international trade, and national security. So we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideas Stream. I'm Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and we're talking today about international law and the Trump administration. Our expert panel includes John Bellinger, former legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State, Paul Williams, a former State Department official who has negotiated a number of international disputes, noted ethicist Shannon French, and international law scholar Milena Stereo. Earlier in the broadcast, we were discussing President Trump's broad approach to international not law. Now let's look specifically at his approach to human rights. I suppose we should start with the executive order banning immigration from seven Muslim countries, which he issued a week after taking the oath of office. Melena Stereo, can you tell us about the immigration executive order? What does it ban and how have the courts responded? Sure. So there are actually two executive orders. The first one, which you mentioned, which President Trump signed on January 27, 2017, did several things. It lowered the number of refugees to be admitted into the United States. It suspended the United States Refugee Admissions Program for 120 days, suspended the entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely, and then suspended for 90 days the entry of aliens coming from seven countries, which included Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. The second executive order 
order, which was signed on March 6, 2017, is supposed to replace the first one, removed Iraq from the list of these seven countries. So now we're left with the six countries and also clarified that the ban did not apply to green heart, green card holders. Now, our courts have been extremely active in the days you know, following the signing of the first executive orders. In the four days following the signing of the first executive order, 50 cases were filed in our federal courts. And most notably, two of our appellate circuits have issued um, and confirmed the issuance of lower courts uh, temporary restraining orders against the executive order. And this has included the Ninth Circuit, which is out in the West, which is a more liberal circuit. But just a few days ago, the Fourth Circuit, which is a lot less liberal, has also essentially held that the executive order was unconstitutional. So a pretty strong uh, uh, pushback from our judiciary against the Trump administration. Now, I, I do want to point out as a lawyer, and four of the five of us are lawyers, that uh, this has been characterized in the press as the issue that made being a lawyer heroic or cool <laughs> again. Yeah. Because the lawyers flooded the airports and they, they represented these people and they brought mm -hmm. these cases and they stood up to power and they've been effective. Mm -hmm. um, now, so far, most of the focus has been on the constitutionality of the ban. And I, I know the Fourth Circuit decision was about the establishment of religion clause. Um, but doesn't this ban arguably also violate international law? Shannon, what's your take on that? Uh, yes, uh, arguably it does. Uh, particularly, there's a number of international agreements that the U.S. is part of uh, that pertain directly to uh, the rights of refugees and also our obligations to them. I mean, just in particular, I'm thinking of the 1951 convention relating to the, the status of refugees. And then there was a subsequent uh, 1967 protocol that related also to the status of refugees. And these require certain very specific things that uh, follow along with uh, taking care of the people in the most danger. So, for example, there are uh, requirements to take in people in certain levels of peril and perhaps most importantly also not to send them back or um, you know, send them directly back into uh, life-threatening danger and so forth. So arguably the ban could do both of those things, well, fail me, at both of those let things. Let me ask John Bellinger a follow-up question to this. Why is it that the U.S. courts are not applying the international law and only applying the, the constitutional provisions to this ban? What do you think? I th well, I think m most of the arguments that are being made by the plaintiffs in the, uh, in, in the cases have been either statutory arguments under the immigration laws or constitutional arguments that this violates uh, uh, people's freedom of religion. Uh, so you really don't see international law arguments being made front and center uh, in most of these cases. And I would say, frankly, that you know, the courts, both the Ninth Circuit, Fourth Circuit, and then the district courts that have been hearing these uh, feel on stronger grounds doing their analysis as a matter of either statutory or constitutional interpretation. Melina? And just on international law, just one quick uh, point of clarification. Mm -hmm. There is a difference uh, with respect to aliens who are applying to come to the United States, who might be abroad, but are applying to come to the United States, and those who are already on U.S. soil. And so some of these treaty provisions really only apply to aliens who are already on U.S. soil. They don't apply to those who are abroad trying to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. So if we had a repeat of that horrible situation during the Holocaust, where there were boatloads of Jewish refugees trying to get to the United States and we turned them away. That would not be in violation of these modern international treaties? Not, not in violation of many of them. Now, there is also obviously a distinction between international law and policy, right? Just because something doesn't you know, patently violate international law doesn't mean that it's good policy when it comes to international relations. All right, so one of the things we're learning is that you can't really cast Donald Trump is an international law violator when international law isn't as extensive as most people believe. Let's um, turn to another area where Donald Trump actually has characterized himself as a champion for human rights. And this is, of course, the April 7th bombing of Syria in response to um, the chemical weapon attacks by the Syrian government against civilians. So, Shannon French, you are a military expert. <laughs> What's your comment on this? Well, I'm a military ethicist, so fair, fair question. 
First of all, I mean, I think I need to admit up front that I was critical of Obama's decision not to stand by his red line uh, in Syria. Uh, And in general, I approve of punishing the Assad regime for its heinous actions. So, you know, put that that out there. However, and I think this is important as well, how you do it matters. And I'm intensely skeptical that that particular strike had much impact. Uh, No terrible pun intended. Um, When when someone is murdering children, the actions taken against that person need to be those that will actually have a chance of protecting those children, protecting other children, rather, from that same fate. And it's not clear to me that the U.S. response did anything lasting to improve the situation for civilians in Syria. Well, in fact, it was reported that Donald Trump or somebody in his administration tipped off the Russians, who then tipped off the Mm -hmm. Assad regime, who then moved the aircraft, and therefore there was virtually no damage done. It was all just a big PR stunt, right? And they didn't uh, even use the kind of uh, weapons that would have made a greater impact on on the runways and so forth. Right. So like a week later, he uses the mother of all bombs, the Moab, (laughs) they call it, right? Yes. In Afghanistan. And instead they use these little, uh, well, they're they're not that small, but cruise missiles that didn't have a major effect in the area. So what do you think was going on there? Well, I mean, the trouble is what it looks like. And I realize I'm in the land of speculation here, but what it looks like is something that was done for show to, to publicly look uh, like you are standing up uh, for the people who were who were murdered, but not actually doing anything, as I said, lasting. And um, if you're not actually helping the victims in any permanent way and you're not preventing future victims, then it, then it's it's all just flash. There's no it's all hat and no cattle. All right. And he hasn't really used any legal justification for this. He just said, mm-hmm. I had to do it because they used the chemical weapons, period. Right. He didn't stop. reach for any. Yeah, that wasn't. Right. So, Milena, you're originally from Serbia, and you have written that the 1999 NATO airstrikes on Serbia, ostensibly, which were to prevent ethnic cleansing of the Kosovar Albanians in the Serb province of Kosovo, you've written that that was not consistent with international law at the time. Would you say that international law currently allows for humanitarian interventions such as the April 7th airstrike. So if Donald Trump had said, I'm doing this consistent with the 1999 airstrikes precedent, would that be justified? Would that be accepted internationally? So first of all, the Kosovo precedent, the United States administration at the time characterized Kosovo not as legal precedent, not as an international law changing event, but rather as a sui generis special case, special circumstances, which is not supposed to create a precedent. So international law currently allows states to use force against other states only in two exceptional situations. One is self-defense. And here, when it comes to Syria, the United States cannot plausibly claim that it's been under an armed attack by uh, President Assad. So self-defense doesn't really apply. Or the second exception is um, United Nations Security Council authorization for the use of force. In the case of Syria, Russia and China have consistently vetoed or threatened to veto any resolution that would authorize the use of force, which then allows leaders like Assad in the absence of humanitarian intervention to essentially do as they wish. And this is what we saw, for example, in Rwanda back in 1994. So there is this argument that is that, that has been made, and I'm sure Paul Williams will, will talk about this too, about an emerging norm of customary law on humanitarian intervention. And I would say that today I'm a um, reluctant supporter of that argument. Well, you've been reading Paul's op-eds in the Huffington Post. Uh, Paul, you should weigh in on this. You, um, in that op-ed, described the April 7th airstrike as consistent with what you characterize as the emerging law of humanitarian intervention under the doctrine of the responsibility to protect. Can you explain your view on that? Um, yes, uh, but first, I'm very excited that Milena has finally uh, evolved in her views to come around uh, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> to welcome, contemplating. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to disagree with Shannon, which I rarely do. But I think I think the value of the airstrikes was that it reestablished a meaningful red line on the use of chemical weapons, and it may set a precedent for future uh, humanitarian intervention responsibility to protect in Syria. Uh, in a nutshell, the document, or sorry, in a nutshell, the doctrine is essentially that. Countries have a responsibility to protect their own civilians from crimes against humanity and other atrocities, and they certainly have a responsibility not to commit those atrocities against their own civilians. And if they do, then other states have a responsibility or a right to take action to stop that from happening. Now, ideally, and some would say, 
legally, you need a UN Security Council to authorize this. But as we know, Russia has you know vetoed you know nearly half a dozen resolutions which would seek to move the process forward in Syria or have a credible threat of the use of force. And many commentators would argue that Russia itself is involved in committing war crimes in Syria. So in this very narrowly tailored situation, one can argue that there is a right of states such as the United States to protect the you know, civilians in Syria from chemical weapons or other types of attracts, attacks and atrocities. Shannon wants to chime in. Well, I just want to say, um, I do very strongly support the responsibility to protect. My concern was that we didn't go far enough, that it wasn't done in a way that actually made the point. But but I'm willing to be wrong about that. I mean, but so I'd Mal- be glad to yeah. be wrong. <laughs> so Malena said that the United States very clearly did not want to use humanitarian intervention as its justification back in 1999. John Bellinger, when you were legal advisor, your administration never argued humanitarian intervention as a justification for use of force, did it? No. And and why? Well, it's been the longstanding view of the United States going back through all administrations. In fact, it's the view of almost every country in the world, uh, except for one or two, uh, that neither the UN Charter nor any other source of international law gives the right to one country to use military force in another country for a humanitarian purpose. Of course, it all sounds like that's a good thing if we were not international lawyers and we're just debating, should one country be able to come to the rescue of people in another country because genocide's being committed or their country's beating up on them? We might all say, yes, that's a great idea as a policy matter. But the way the UN Charter works and international law works is basically to be very protective of states to prevent one country from intervening in another country. Uh, so. The international law right now, and the United States observes this, is that there is no right under international law to intervene uh, in another country to protect people. Uh, In the case of the Kosovo situation, as Milena mentioned, the Clinton administration said that it was justified in doing what it was doing, but it did not say that it was lawful. In President Trump's case, he again said that he had done the right thing but he didn't give either a justification more broadly or explain uh, that it was legal. So this norm of humanitarian intervention that's emerging, it may be only about the little tip of a blade of grass that's coming out of the ground Mm -hmm. right now. It doesn't mean that it's not a good norm, but there are very few international lawyers or governments who say that international law permits humanitarian intervention. And to stay with your metaphor, I would say that the lawnmower that's keeping it down (laughs) is probably the possibility of abuse. Because I know when people were discussing adopting the R2P, the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, that um, Russia actually invaded South Ossetia, Georgia, claiming its right and justification under the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, humanitarian intervention. And I think a lot of countries woke up and said, whoa, wait a minute, let's put that genie back in the bottle because there are real risks for abuse. Would you agree, John? Yeah, Michael, that is exactly right. And this is really important for listeners to understand is why the United States would not just say, well, it's a good thing to intervene in another country if we think so. Uh, but you know, just because the United States may think that it is virtuous and doing the right thing, you know, we may be setting a precedent for other countries, and there may be other countries uh, like Russia, uh, like China, uh, like others, that uh, if they intervene claiming that they are doing it for a virtuous humanitarian purpose, that we would then be unable to criticize them uh, if we ourselves have, in fact, uh, used force. So this is one reason why successive administrations Republican and Democratic, uh, are uh, very cautious about claiming a right of one country to intervene militarily in another country for a a humanitarian purpose, lest we give a green light uh, to others to uh, do something in a a less virtuous situation. So for those who are looking at the April 7th attack and saying, oh my gosh, Donald Trump's going to end up creating a precedent that is very pro-human rights, what I hear is not so much, that he has not used legal justifications on purpose and that the United States, like 
subsequent administrations is not yet ready to embrace that. Is, is that the consensus, Melina? Yeah, I mean, I think that is definitely the consensus, or at least that is at least my opinion. Um, and again, one of you know the, the focus of Donald Trump's foreign policy and Donald Trump as a, as a person really has been to display American strength. We are a powerful nation militarily, and so I think this is really a lot more about displaying that kind of strength. And you know, we can we can talk about whether in Syria it was for show or, or or whether it was really to protect the civilians, but I think it's really more about displaying the strength, less about human rights. And and if anything, this this recent trip to Saudi Arabia, I think, displays this notion that the current administration really doesn't care that much about human rights. We're positioning ourselves right. as a big well, champion of Saudi Arabia. Let's talk about that. So <laughs> in other areas, President Trump has been characterized as elevating realpolitik over human rights. Um, so, for example, he invited the president of the Philippines to the White House, <laughs> despite Duterte's uh, record of killing, I guess, 5,000 suspected drug dealers in his country without criminal charges. And I think he's at the verge of declaring martial law. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had just referred to this, but when President Trump visited Saudi Arabia last week, he told the Saudis, quote, America will no longer seek to impose our way of life on others. Shannon, <laughs> the ethicist. <laughs> Is this a departure from the approach of past presidents, or is it a continuation? Well, I mean, for a number of reasons. Other U.S. leaders have stopped short of taking dramatic action in a lot of cases to press for improvements in human rights in other countries. And let's be honest, they've even covertly supported some violators. We have to admit our past as far as that goes. Pinochet comes to mind. Uh, but I would argue this is worse because what we're seeing is this appears to be the administration not only failing to press for human rights reforms, but actually openly condoning or seeming supportive of human rights abusers. And it should be noted that at times the U.S. has tried to be a leader in pushing for reforms. And I feel that abdicating that responsibility and that opportunity, uh, given the power that we have on the world stage, is very difficult to defend from an ethical perspective. All right. Well, it's time for another short break. When we return, we'll talk about the Trump administration's approach to rogue states, as well as to the international treaties dealing with climate change and international trade. Back in a moment. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined today by experts in international law and diplomacy, and we've been talking about international law and the Trump administration. In this final segment of our broadcast, we'll discuss President Trump's views of international law in the context of trade treaties, climate change, North Korea, and Iran. So one of the first things that President Trump did was announce that he would not proceed with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which is a free trade agreement with a number of Asian countries. I was actually in China on election eve, and my Chinese colleagues were rooting for Trump to win the election. This is a surprise, I think, to many people to hear. And the reason was because they thought he would kill the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, which would pave the way for China to fill the vacuum and enter into favorable uh, trade deals with its neighbors. All right. So then after that, Trump set his sights on the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. And initially, Trump said that he would pull out of NAFTA, and now he's interested in renegotiating it. John Bellinger, what will likely be the result? Well, of course, the candidate, President Trump, or then, then candidate Trump, said that he would rip up numerous agreements, that the Iran deal was a terrible deal, that he was going to cancel the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, that he was going to pull out of TPP and pull out of NAFTA. Uh, so there are a lot of international agreements that he doesn't like. As president, uh, I think a number of his advisors have talked to him about the value of many of these agreements. Of course, he did pull out of TPP, but of course, uh, Hillary Clinton said that she would do the same. So he's still been saber rattling about each of these, but has not pulled out of them. So what would he actually do? I think on NAFTA, Many people across the political spectrum agree that NAFTA does need to have some of its provisions renegotiated. It needs to be modernized. It was uh, negotiated at a different time. So the answer is not to pull out of it because it's been an enormous benefit for many, many, many people in the United States. So it wouldn't make a lot of sense to pull out of it, but it does need to be modernized to protect intellectual property rights, to ad address digital trade over the internet and, and other such things. So I think we can expect that he 
will push to renegotiate it. Uh, probably some changes will be made that people will agree on uh, and that President Trump would then declare victory uh, and vindication. And John, there's this new executive order that says no new treaties, full stop. What's your take on that? Have we ever seen anything like that in the past? Well, that one actually didn't get signed, uh, fortunately. Uh, that one was one that really worried me as a former legal advisor for the State Department who was responsible for the negotiation and Senate approval of treaties. There were, in about the first 10 days, a, a draft executive order was leaked from the White House that uh, would have set up a committee to review all of the treaties to which the United States was a party and recommend which ones we should pull out of. And the premise for that seemed to be, it was very odd, that somehow the United States was party to numerous agreements that were not in our interest. And it, it clearly reflected some impulse in the either the Trump administration or the conservative movement uh, that we are party to lots of treaties that are not in our interest. There are certainly some treaties that we haven't joined that are not in our interest, and that's why we haven't joined them. But I think most people would be hard-pressed to say that there uh, are many treaties, if any, that are really not in the U.S. interest. We benefit from the treaties that we have negotiated and joined every single day, and Americans gain great benefits from the different treaties that have been negotiated. So fortunately, that executive order uh, was not signed. Uh, cooler heads have prevailed, but there right. clearly is a suspicion of treaties. So. That was sort of a trial balloon. And then, as you said, cooler heads prevailed. International law actually took precedence. I'm just curious, John, who are the cooler heads that you perceive are, are acting in, on these kinds of issues? Well, I think you've got both the career people out of the State Department who are uh, career lawyers and Defense Department and Justice Department who have pointed out the benefits of the many both bilateral, meaning treaties with a single other country, or multilateral treaties, meaning with lots of countries that we are party to. Uh, those have been uh, brought forward to the White House. And then some of the president's own advisors, presumably like uh, Secretary Mattis, even though he's not an international lawyer, and even some of the people inside the White House have made clear to the president the benefit of treaties to which we have been party uh, to uh, uh, for a long time. And one of the most controversial treaties that's still under consideration is the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, I know that President Trump has publicly said he's skeptical about the science behind global warming, and they are currently considering whether to pull out of that agreement. Melina, what does the Paris Agreement require of the United States? So the Paris Agreement, in a nutshell, requires the United States and other signatories to this agreement to re to do things like report on carbon emissions, to undergo international review about this, and to establish future bank benchmarks for emissions. The Paris Agreement also aims to limit global warming in general to about 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above pre-industrial levels. And although some have complained that the Paris Agreement, agreement has very weak um, enforcement mechanisms, I think most in this field would agree that this agreement is one of the most far-reaching international environmental pacts in history. So on March 28th, on another executive order, this one was issued on climate change. Um, does that new executive order prevent the United States from meeting its commitments under the Paris Agreement? So pursuant to that executive order, we have not actually withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement, although it's unclear as of today that we will or will not. Um, most agree, though, that although in theory the United States can still comply with its commitments under the Paris Agreement, in practice, uh, most agree that it will be very, very difficult for the United States to meet our commitments unless we stick to essentially Obama-era policies and regulations that the Environmental Protection Agency had been working on. So, so if, if there's a major reversal on those, it's going to be very difficult for us to comply. If we miss the commitments, any consequences to the United States? Well, you know, it boils down to this issue of, you know, why do nations comply with international law and what is the benefit of signing on to big multilateral treaties when it comes to the protection of the environment? Obviously, all of us benefit if global warming is limited, if there aren't many carbon em emissions, if you know all states essentially abide by the same set of rules. All right. Now, I want to make sure that we spend some time talking about international law and President Trump's policies toward Iran and North Korea, because I think that's what's keeping Americans up at night. So during Trump's visit 
in the Middle East last week. He seemed bent on uniting the region around a common enemy, Iran. During the campaign, Trump said that Iran's nuclear agreement with the United States was, quote, the worst deal ever negotiated. (laughs) And he repeatedly promised that as president, he would immediately scrap it. Well, here we are four months into the Trump's uh, presidency, and the nuclear deal is still there. The State Department just informed Congress that Iran was actually in compliance, and the Trump administration has extended all of the sanctions relief that Iran was promised as part of the deal. So, John Bellinger, where do you see things heading with the Iran nuclear accord? Well, I think this actually reflects the trajectory that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes of things that uh, candidate Trump said and the things that President Trump has done. Some of that is what we see with respect to any politician, the difference between being a candidate and governing. Uh, But I think in Donald Trump's case in particular, because he had no government experience at all and really had not learned a lot about these agreements, that he's now got a lot of people talking to him about the value of these different agreements. So he has been very hostile as a candidate and as president towards Iran and has done a lot of saber rattling. But apparently people in his administration, again, Uh, presumably Defense Secretary Mattis and maybe Secretary of State Tillerson uh, have convinced him that at least for now it makes sense to stay in the Iran deal as a way to constrain Iran's uh, nuclear uh, or rather uranium enrichment program. So he has cranked up some unilateral sanctions, meaning sanctions by the United States alone on Iran, but he has not yet scrapped the Iran deal. So I think we will have to stay tuned. Anybody else want to chime in on that? Well, I mean, I, I think we John Bellinger talked earlier about when we talked about the major foreign policy goals or objectives of the Trump administration, the focus on deals. Like, is the Iran uh, agreement a good deal or not? I think it's very difficult to look at just the Iran agreement as a single deal. I think you have to look at our overall policy in the Middle East. And I'm, I'm hopeful that there are people, folks in the Trump administration who have, you know, wisely advised the president that the deal itself is an important piece of our more um, uh, general Middle Eastern policy. All right. The other threat that President Trump has been talking about a lot lately is North Korea. Since his election, North Korea has had eight missile tests. Some of them have not gone so well, but there was a successful launch last week of a missile capable of carrying a nuclear bomb over a long distance, according to the press. These are in violation of UN Security Council resolutions, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, they are. <laughs> okay. So speaking to Reuters last month, President Trump said, quote, there is a chance that we could end up having a major conflict with North Korea. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's turn to Paul Williams. Paul, you're the peace negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> is this bluster or are we heading for a showdown with North Korea? And, and will, well, will President Trump cite international law to justify any military actions he takes? Well, I think, Michael, we, we are likely heading to some type of, of showdown with North Korea, be it diplomatic or, or military. It's, it's very clear that the, the North Korean leadership is, is bent on um, finding a way to deliver you know, a nuclear warhead to the continental United States. The, it's also very clear that it's in, in flagrant violation of, of international law. And importantly, we're going to need both China and South Korea to be part of the effort to resolve this. And this is a case where uh, the Trump administration could be using international law to to strengthen its case, to build the coalition. Again, international law would not be determinative, but the fact that North Korea is operating so far outside of the norm of, of legal behavior is something that we could be using with the Chinese and with the South Koreans. And as things heat up, you are going to need a legal justification. And, and the difficulty is if he's either eroding legal norms or simply ignoring them in the other areas of U.S. foreign policy and, and action, it's going to be difficult to, to cast the United States as uh, an entity who's acting consistent with international law as it seeks to rein in North Korea, either diplomatically or through economic sanctions or, heaven forbid, militarily. And I guess the problem with the John Bolton quote that we discussed at the top of the hour where John Bolton had said international law is not real law and if you think differently you're delusional is that you can't use it when you need it, right? And so President Trump may become an advocate for international law if he sees it as as a useful tool in his box. Is that what you're saying, Paul? 
One could hope so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, when he does these things, I, oh, I guess um, we recently read that he told the Philippines president over the phone that he is going to be moving two American nuclear armed submarines to off the coast of North Korea. And um, the Pentagon, I, I alluded to this earlier in my conversation with Shannon, was not happy about that. Shannon, why not? You're the military expert. Well, I mean, it's been disputed that in that case, that information was already out there. But just generally, there seems to be broad, I'll, I'll say broad concern, both domestically and abroad, uh, that um, Donald Trump just spills things that are meant to be secret. And that, uh, and it's somewhat ironic because, again, in his campaign, he was very critical of other leaders that he felt had telegraphed too much what the U.S. was going to do in advance. And he said, you know, you don't tell your policies before you enact them or your next military move before you do it. And yet he seems to be guilty of quite a lot of that kind of telegraphing. But isn't his position that everybody else has to apply by the rules of secrecy, but as president, he has the right to declassify anything and therefore he cannot be held responsible? Well, I mean, those are two different things. Uh, yes, he has the right to do it, uh, but uh, he can be held responsible for the consequences of exercising that right in, in a way that uh, causes these kind of problems. All right. Now, the other thing that bothered a lot of people about the way he's conducting foreign policy is that he seems to be the only president in history who announces major foreign policy views on Twitter. <laughs> and his positions, some people believe, have been contradictory and emotionally charged. Um, some have suggested that President Trump's apparent instability is actually a strength. <laughs> In fact, that it, it keeps our enemies and rivals off balance and unable to guess the United States' next moves. So, Shannon, <laughs> you're also an expert at leadership. And your, your center that you run, right? Yeah. It's, it's called the, the Center for mm -hmm. Ethical Leadership. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's what we right. focus on. So would you say that this is a sound <laughs> tactic or strategy for leaders to follow? In a word, no. Uh, there, there's this famous uh, shelling quote or, or example where if you are handcuffed to a, a madman uh, and you're near the edge of a cliff and you're in great mortal peril, that uh, well, you should do the unexpected. You should start dancing or something like that to throw them off balance. And people love to use that as a way of saying that this is quite clever. You know, if you're erratic and no one can predict your next move, you have the advantage. What they miss is that that is a desperate strategy when you have no other choices, when you are the weaker or disadvantaged person in some kind of conflict. That's not at all the situation that the U.S. is in. We are still, <laughs> at the moment, a superpower. Uh, we would like to remain so. And as such, we as a world leader, have to show stability. We have to be reliable. People actually need to know uh, what we're going to do. Not, again, telegraphing specific military moves, but policy. They need to be able to count on us. Countries like Japan don't want to have to worry if we're still going to continue to defend them. Our NATO allies, as we mentioned earlier, uh, don't want to have to wonder about whether we will, in fact, honor Article 5. That kind of instability helps no one. It doesn't help the U.S., and it certainly uh, doesn't help our allies. We also have to have very clear lines. We talked about red lines earlier. We have to have clear lines concerning what we will and will not tolerate that our enemies can trust and can rely on. So uh, if we show our allies that we're a reliable partner and we show our enemies that we will follow through on the more meaningful threats that we make, then that stabilizes arguably the entire uh, political world. Uh, but if we fail to do that and if people are always in this, this nervous guesswork, that doesn't make anyone safer. All right. So one of the things that I'm wondering about throughout this discussion is how much of these decisions does he make at three in the morning on Twitter <laughs> versus how much does, is he listening to his advisors? And I note that the president and secretary of state have left unfilled a large number of senior positions at the State Department. Uh, John Bellinger, would you say this is a strategy that reflects the president's views on international law and diplomacy? It's very hard to tell. You know, here we are in almost June, uh, and we've finally had a deputy secretary uh, who's been confirmed, uh, but none of the other positions have even been nominated, uh, much less confirmed by the Senate. So it's hard to tell whether this is a 
effort to frankly neuter the State Department uh, or whether there are disagreements between Secretary Tillerson and the White House. The odd thing is, although there may be a few positions that one could argue about whether they need to be reshuffled, changed, maybe not filled, there are certainly many positions that we have to have and that you know, we, one would want to have political appointees in as the assistant secretary for the Near East or the assistant secretary for Asia. Secretary Tillerson, particularly who is a neophyte himself to foreign policy, needs people in those positions. So it is puzzling why they have not been filled. So, John, I want to follow up with you by putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, you were a Republican political appointee. But you wrote a letter last August joined by 50 former national security officials stating that Donald Trump lacked the character, values, and experience to be president and that he would be the most reckless president in all of history. Do you still hold to that assessment? I remain very concerned about many of his statements and actions as president. The letter was written by very senior officials who had worked very closely with former presidents and who saw what it takes to be president of the United States. It's hard to be president. Donald Trump has even said, it's much harder to be president than I thought. I think it was reckless for him to share sensitive intelligence information in the Oval Office with the Russian foreign minister. All right. But more, more broadly, though, Don, we know, have to come to the other leaders the need close to of trust our show the now. president. All right. So, on that cheery note, <laughs> we do need to wrap up the program. It's the time has flown by. John Bellinger, Paul Williams, Shannon French, and Melina Stereo, thank you all so much provide, for providing your insights on international law and the Trump administration. I'm Michael Scharf, and you've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN Idea Stream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on this show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu. Thank you.